Does university still deliver on its promise to give students an educational experience that will both fill them with wonder and help them get a meaningful job? Well, recent evidence suggests there may be a growing mismatch between what students are learning and what the labor market wants. Ken Coates is co-author of Dream Factories, Why Universities Won't Solve the Youth Jobs Crisis, and he joins us now for more. It's nice to meet you in person. It's great to be with you. Yeah, we've had you on before, but it was always on the satellite. And That's right. It was good to talk over long better. distances. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, your book is about universities no longer being able to you know, deliver the goods when it comes to the promise of turning learning into earning. Where's the general evidence for that? Boy, it's all over the place. In the United States, half of the people who get university degrees, which represents only half the people who start a university program, only half of them actually get jobs that require a degree. And underemployment in Canada for many years has been second, third, fourth in the, in the world in terms of university graduates who are doing jobs that don't require a university degree. And there's two ways of looking at that. One of them is to say, oh, the universities are not doing a very good job at training people for the workforce. And the other way of looking at it is to say the workforce isn't receptive to university graduates. They, hmm. they can't take as many as they're, as they're being produced. I think the number one problem is we have way too many people coming out of university with substandard qualifications. They, the, the, the degrees are fine, the universities are fine, but their abilities and their, their, what they've actually absor absorbed in their time in university just doesn't match up with expectations. You're saying even with half the people who go into university dropping out, we're still graduating too many university That's grads. That's right. Those are American numbers. We actually have about 30% of the people who come into Canadian universities don't complete their degrees. It varies widely. Some universities are the highest 50%, and some places like Queens and Waterloo down around 10 and 11 percent. But it's still too many. It, well, it is in the sense that when you look and say, why are people going to university? Overwhelmingly, they're going to university to get a job. That's the, the first mistake. Well, in the sense, of course it is. Yeah. Universities are hard work. They require a lot of creativity, a lot of effort, a lot of commitment, right? And if you're going there because your mom and dad tell you to go there to get a job, and you even picked your program because you were told electrical engineering is actually better than getting an English degree, mm -hmm. and you, it might be wrong, but you're going to the wrong things, you're not enjoying it. You're not there to absorb the knowledge and capitalize on the opportunities. Very, very frustrating for the students, right? So we end up with real problems of commitment and real problems of dedication to their studies. And we graduate people, not all of them, some brilliant students come through our system. Mm -hmm. the, reach, the new current crop of university graduates are as good, if not better, than they've ever been before. Um, but we, the lower end, the bottom half of that cohort, the people aren't very well educated because they haven't necessarily put the effort in themselves. Are the people who are really bright coming out of university really bright because they're really bright or because the university has helped make them really bright? Oh boy, that's a hurtful question. Uh, because in fact the research, particularly again, Americans have way better research on this. And the research basically says that, that you know, a big portion of your success at university and after university is determined by your family, your educational backgrounds of your parents and your family income. We, we know those going in. If you want to pick the best cohort of students, pick their postal codes. Right. Find out where they come from. You'll know about the income of the families, their, their, their personal wealth, and you can pick the people who are likely to succeed. Um, so somebody who goes to this university and goes to University of Toronto and gets a great degree in business, and they prosper. They become a millionaire. Well, maybe their parents were millionaires. Donald Trump his father was a millionaire. So you can't, you're saying UT can't take credit for that? Well, they, they take credit for all of it. They do, but they, they shouldn't. They, they should be really careful about it, right? Okay. In the sense that they should be credited for the knowledge they put in, the opportunities they provide. I think universities are fantastic for the opportunities they give. And it's mixed as to about the outcome. In a technical field like engineering, you can't just pick that up off the corner. You can't just read a newspaper and be, you know, be excellent at that. But there are lots and lots of people who do, are really smart, really bright, don't go to university, have huge and wonderful careers without the benefit of those four years or five years or six years, depending how long they, how long they go. Let me toss a bunch of numbers at you here, and then I'll get you to react to this. This is from the Council of Ontario Universities, which, of course, is the body that represents all of the publicly funded universities in Ontario. I think there's 20 of them. They released the results of the Ontario Graduate Survey. Now, this is admittedly four-year-old information here, but six months after graduation, the class of 2012 had an average income 7% below that of the class of 2005, so seven years earlier. Two years after graduation, incomes dropped to 14% below the class that graduated seven years earlier. 
It's going in the wrong direction, in other words. Why is that happening? Well, it really is going in the wrong direction, and that's incorrect to blame the universities for that, um, because the universities are doing what their, their parents want, doing what government wants, and doing what the students want. But the economy has shifted very, very dramatically. You know, we've, we've lost a huge number of middle-class jobs. I remember seeing a, a story, a very small story in the newspaper. One of the banks had laid off 1,500 people. Uh, over the course of a summer. They do this in the summertime when the announcement comes out. Nobody notices it. And they have another thing talking about improving customer performance, which is about going online. So they're getting more people are happy with their banking experience through a better website that they can use. And 1,500 people no longer have a job. If you lay 1,500 people off at a tomato factory in, in Leamington, Which it's national do. news. Yeah. And for days and days and days, 1,500 middle class, well paid sort of professionals, many of whom have university degrees and college diplomas, they get laid off. And it's just a blump in the storyline. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, we've lost a lot of those jobs. If you look at the way um, government has downsized, if you look at the way that um, um, big corporations are operating, taking out middle management positions. But you're talking about a changing labor market as opposed to anything universities are doing wrong, right? Well, ab absolutely. So, but but here's, here's where these things get complicated. And when I, was, I was the dean of arts at the University of Waterloo, which is one of the great universities in North America. I just adored my time there. 15% of the graduates from the uh, College of Art, Faculty of Arts, went immediately to community colleges after they graduated. So they went and got a respiratory technologist diploma. So a couple of years down the line, they're making $70,000 a year. They got a Bachelor of Arts in History, which is my discipline, respiratory technology diploma. They're getting a job in respiratory technology. They show up on, this, on their scales as a success for the university. Hmm. Are they? They could have gone right out of high school and gotten that degree. They maybe really wanted the history degree, and God, God bless them, it's a wonderful degree to have. But in terms of career progress, you know, you have to be really careful about counting those numbers. I get you, but I'm going to push back a little bit here. The community college can take credit for the fact that that person's a good respiratory therapist. The university can take credit for the fact that that person's a better citizen, right? Maybe. Um, so here's another one of the things I have trouble with around universities, because when universities talk about this, and I love universities, you're not a word you're going to ever hear from me that says I hate universities, I adore universities, wonderful environments, great places to learn. But we have a lot of students who don't come to class, we have a lot of students who put in lousy assignments, we have a lot of students who don't read the newspaper, a lot of students who aren't engaged in public affairs. And it varies. When I look at the really engaged undergraduates now, they're as brilliant and engaged as they were in the 1960s and we thought we invented the, and transformed the world. They're marvelous students with huge levels of commitment. But you know, these commuter campuses where students come and go and they don't participate in campus affairs, you know, those are harder to sort of prove that you get this wonderful bulge in citizenship. Yes, people who go to university are more likely to vote. People of high income are also more likely to vote. People of high income are more likely to go to university. So which is the cause and consequence? All right, in which case do you think, or put it this way, at what point do you think universities lost their ability to make the claim that you come to us, give us three, four, five, however many years of your life, and we guarantee you pretty much the solid middle class dream come true? Well, they do that a lot, and you actually hear this phrase about the million dollar bonus that you get. You go to university, you make a million dollars more than you do if you, if you don't go to university. Over the course of your life. Over the course of your life. And that sounds great, and that's, that's a very attractive sort of, sort of element. The problem with that is an average. It's sort of, and, and it's actually changing too, it's not as strong as it was before, because people going to polytechnics are doing really well, people going to selected college programs are doing really well. The answer in universities is twofold. There are certain programs where going to university is a requirement. You want to be a doctor, you got to go. You want to be an accountant, you have to go. You want to be an economist, you have to go. Those pay higher really high incomes. The other people, we got lots of programs, not a lot of programs, some programs, that are producing lower incomes than people who have just high school diplomas, hmm. right? Because they're not career designed. They're not intended to do that. And that's perfectly fine as a way of getting a, a learning and getting an education and understanding the world. Cultural studies or film studies can be absolutely brilliant. But if the goal is to get a degree and then get a university, you get a job, and then make a million dollars more than if you just gone out of high school, we know that isn't working. And I think part of the problem, my answer to this, is the point at which we decided that access was the single most important thing in the university system. Hmm. That, that opening up the floodgates, letting more and more and more people in, a higher percentage of students out of the high school system all the time, opening up universities all over the, all, all over the world, all over the country and, and in Canada. I was involved with the setting up of, of the University of Northern British Columbia. We went from an 8% uh, high school university participation rate before we opened up to 24%, which is the national average, the first year of operations that in sound, Northern British Columbia. That sounds good. 
It's wonderful. But, I, but I, oh, really? But th does that devalue the value of the degree? Well, this is an interesting case because there's a university in Ontario called Laurentian. It's actually wonderful in this, re in this regard. I've heard of it. Yeah, exactly, I know. <laughs> um, and, and, but, Th but Thunder Bay does the same sort of thing. There, we brought a lot of people into the University of Northern British Columbia who would never have gone to university. Their family couldn't afford to have them relocate. Somebody living in Vancouver can go to two great universities, Simon Fraser or, or UBC, go to a whole bunch of university colleges, Kwantlen and Capilano and whatever, and they have, by taking the bus, if you live in northern British Columbia, you live in Burns Lake, if you actually you know, live up in Timmins, it's going to cost you ten dollars to $15,000, $20,000 a year more than if somebody who lives in downtown Toronto mm -hmm. to go to university. So they weren't going at all. So what you did in cases like that, those northern institutions cap, touched into untapped potential, got people into the system. But they became part of a process of letting more and more and more people in. And if you look at the grade point averages of people coming into some of those institutions, they're dropping down because they're competing with all these larger universities. Now we're bringing in international students, uh, many of whom are wonderful, bringing large numbers of international students into our campuses. But do you think that a remote Canadian university is top of mind for somebody in Shanghai who was going to be willing to spend $200,000 for their child to go to university over four or five years? They weren't thinking about those northern institutions or the rural institutions when they were making those plans. They just couldn't get into the first 150 universities they really wanted to go to. And so they, they basically, the quality of the students has a huge impact. That's why Harvard, Stanford, why you know, Queens has such great results from some of their employment opportunities. They bring in the best students. Here's uh, you. <laughs> this is from an article you did in the Walrus Magazine back in 2012. In the three generations since World War II, Canadian universities have shifted from being preserves of the rich, the gifted, and the intensely ambitious into the academic equivalent of intramural sports where the premium rests on mass participation rather than on high achievement. Have the universities expanded beyond the point where excellence is now possible in your view? Um, the university system has expanded. The way it's gone, it, the way it's developed, we've allowed some of our universities to become more selective. The University of Waterloo is great, Queens is great, McGill is great. These places have really high entrance standards. Um, they then have programs inside those, those, those classes, so Vic won at the University of Toronto, absolutely brilliant program. I wish every student in the world could go to Vic One at the University of Toronto and be exposed to that. Tell every, take 30 seconds to explain what it is. What happens is in the first year at the University of Toronto at Victoria University, you basically go in and you sit down in a small class with some of the best teachers in the world, best researchers, and you have a personalized experience of first year university. My daughter went to the University of Toronto. She didn't actually get into that program. She didn't even, even try. You would think you wouldn't have gotten in. Um, she had an average of 350 students in each one of her first year classes. Mm. Most of her instructors were not full time professors at the university. She just stopped after one year and said, What am I doing here? Mm. You know, so if you look at the way we actually teach, you take the students in greatest need, the ones that really need to be handheld and shaped and mentored and encouraged and stopped it in their tracks to say, You show up in this class and, and do your assignment. How do you do that with a class of 800 or 1,000 students? You can't. You can't, and you don't. We save that for graduate school. And if you actually, we would, we would reverse the whole process, put your intense programs into the first year, but those programs that we have like that in Canadian universities are for the elite. We use them as, as uh, recruitment tools. Hmm. You're a 92% average or 96% average. We really want you to come here, come to this university, come into Vic One, or comparable programs at other institutions. So. You, you have to be careful here. There are some universities that have excellence as a, at, at their heart and soul. They have other universities that deliberately have access. And so they're looking and saying, we're going to bring Aboriginal students out of rural Manitoba, we're going to bring them into a campus. They're not going to obsess about what they do in their first year. We're going to work with them over four years and actually help them develop into, a, into a, the, the kind of intellect and kind of professional they want to be. Um, a place like Brandon University has a 50% dropout rate. There's a huge social cost to that. It isn't just the cost of money, time wasted and money, money spent. It's the actual f fear of failure and the impact of failure on individuals. My personal view is be really careful, select people who are going to succeed, and crank up our expectations. Let the students know that if they're coming to university, attend, participate, read, read, and read and occasionally watch the agenda. <laughs> I like the last part of that advice. Do you know Ron Srigley at UPEI? Yes. Okay. Not personally, but I've read his stuff. You read his stuff. He was in the Walrus not too long ago. Now's a good time for a sip of water if you want, because I'm going to read a little excerpt here of a piece that he wrote for the LA Review of Books. He says, there is no real education anymore, but I still have to create the impression that education is happening. This is a professor at UPEI speaking. 
Students will therefore come to class, but they will not learn. Professors will give lectures, but they will not teach. Students will receive grades, but they will not earn them. Awards and degrees will be granted, but they will exist only on paper. Smiling students will be photographed at graduation, but they will not be happy. Oh, Ken, is it really all that bad? Yes and no, in equal measure. So on the, on the no side, as a professor, I really resent that because I teach. My wife teaches at the University of Saskatchewan, and we spend a huge amount of time, how much time she spends. And, you know, she's emailing students, you weren't in class yesterday. You're c c coming in and talk to me. You're going to rewrite your essay. You'll learn how to write. So there are lots of professors, lots and lots of professors who devote their heart and soul to their students and who agonize over failure, just literally agonize over failure. If they have a 1,200 students in a first-year biology class, they don't because there's no way. They haven't got the yeah. resources to reach out and yeah. do that sort of thing. So what happens is that, is that that description is actually way more accurate than you might think. Students come in with computers on their desks, and half of them we know from the research are want, reading new, uh, emails, watching movies, doing things like that, not engaged in the class at all. Why are you even here, right? Mm -hmm. But the, every class has you know, 10, 20, 30% of the students completely engaged. So. A lot of the professors are wonderful teachers. A lot of the students are wonderful learners. But the problem is if people are coming for the wrong reason and are being selected because the universities need to pay their bills, the number one fault of our system, the number one fault of our system by far, is, is the fact that we have this bums and chairs financial model. This is what you just explained. This is the funding formula that says you get more money as a university the more students you attract. Absolutely. If you take a look, I'm just pick on Laurentian again because I'm very fond of that institution. <laughs> it has a massive mandate to serve the central part of, of, of Ontario. It reaches out. It has Aboriginal programming is really excellent, Northern programming. It, it provides professional opportunities for kids who would never have a chance to do them before. These are great places like UNBC. It's like Brandon, like University of Brunswick at St. John. These are really, really good schools doing, doing a certain thing. But they're on the same trajectory of having to find more students. And if you take a look at what the, the areas where the population is declining, the Maritimes has had a catastrophic decline mm. in high school graduate, graduates uh, coming into the system. They're looking all around the world for somebody just to fill in the chairs. Yeah. And I, I feel that it's a, it, there's, a, there's a moral question about letting somebody in when you know they have a, a really substantial chance of failure. So the research is quite strong on this. It doesn't mean it covers everybody. If you come out of high school with it, le less than a 75 at the low end, 80% average out of high school, your chances of succeeding are actually very small. If it's below 75 to 80%, mm -hmm. we know that. But, but we're the, still letting them in. But what's the alternative there? Take more students in and don't give them more money to deal with the additional student role? Well, you don't, there's nothing that says universities have to be funded on the basis of the number of students you have in your chairs, right? Memorial University is funded on a block grant. Here's how much money, do the best you can. So that encourages them to bring fewer students in. To bring in fewer students and to teach them better, more effectively. So is that the future in your view? I, I hope so. I, I don't think so. Because, you see, when you look at governments, you know, the number of times where you hear governments talking about academic excellence and talking about the huge commitment of the people, the students that they have to make to go to university, basically the politicians, the political level, the question is access. They want to make sure that, 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 that Mary and Bob, who have two kids that are about university age, that they want to go to university, yep, your kids can go to university. Uh, all right, let me pick up on this, because I wonder how much of this is the students and how much of this is really the parents. And I'm going to show some StatsCan's number here. Excuse me, Statistics Canada numbers here. Apparently, 67% of parents want their children to go to university, compared with 15% who hope for college or cégep in Quebec. 2% wish for their kids to get a trade certificate. This is about parents wanting to be able to say, Johnny got into university, isn't it? Well, they really want to say Johnny got out of university or Mary got out of <laughs> university. Right. They absolutely want them to go, put enormous pressure on the kids early on. My mother and father, when I was a really a kid, used to have the, the mother's allowance, baby bonus. Oh, yeah. And they put that money aside every single month directly into our university savings account. And they told me every month. It was in the university savings account. We put more money in there. So, you, so there was no question in your mind you were going to university. Was, oh, my mother would have shot me. I love my mother. <laughs> She's a wonderful lady, and she just she didn't get to go. And so to her, this was this golden chalice that you could reach up and grab, and it was this absolutely wonderful thing. The numbers are even higher in the Maritimes because a university degree is seen as a sort of a ticket into prosperity and middle-class opportunity, all the things we've kind of talked about before. 
There's no question that people see it that way. But the other side of it is, is this degradation of the value of physical labor mm. and outside labor and the, 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 the apprenticeship programs and the trades programs. We have jobs without people and people without jobs. Absolutely. And we have, a, you know, one of my favorite institutions in the country because they're evolving so quickly right now are the polytechs, where they have the, the four years of study for more intensive things that are more complicated, the diploma type programs that are two year intensive sort of opportunities. They're very much connected to regional job markets. Markets. They have the employers coming in and telling them what to teach and coordinating in that way. So if you want a job, there's lots of places. You go to SIAST or uh, in, in Saskatchewan, SAS Poly. If you go to Nate or SAIT in Alberta, BCIT. If you go to George Brown, Sheridan. Sheridan is one of the most brilliant post-secondary institutions in the country. And, you know, when you look at when politicians go to talk about innovation, they all go to Waterloo. God bless them. We love to say all, all, all of them and everything they came down. The city of Waterloo, Kitchener, loved having them come. Well, what's wrong with Sheridan? <laughs> Sheridan is a brilliant post-secondary institution. And it is very much sort of in the parental mindset, particularly among new Canadians. Mm. And new Canadians come here, they value education generally higher. It's part of their strategy. You immigrate into Canada, you have access to an inexpensive public education system. They push the kids really strongly into those, into those fields. Um, many of them do exceptionally well. But some of them actually should have been truck drivers and they should have been bulldozer operators or electricians and they, they do really well financially. Well tell me what you think of this idea. In Estonia I'm told the government there apparently subsidizes all the students who go into high demand areas but if you want to study in other areas where the labor market is not so interested no such luck. Um, should we do that? Well, it's, that's a really interesting question. What they actually do there is a little bit different from what you said, more or less what you said, but they also decide that the country needs 25 historians. It doesn't need 125. Mm. So if you're the 26, the 25 best high school graduates who want to study history, get in. You're the 26th and you really want to study history, you pay the full rate. Right? So it's a, it's a, you're like an international student who would be in, would be in Canada. Mm. And, and what they're trying to do is to balance these things off. Here's the problem. Universities, governments uh, are not very good about deciding where the future job market is going to be. If you watch the mismatch between the production of teachers and the number of jobs in the teaching profession, it's almost always out of whack. They have problems with nursing and whatever else. So would you feel confident enough as a very well-educated observer of Ontario to tell me where six to seven years from now the primary job market is going to be in this province? Certainly not. Nobody knows. No. And so it's, in one sense it's easy to say that because but, but five years ago, we would have been telling everybody, please be a mining engineer. And if you aren't be a mining engineer, be a petroleum engineer. Because there's going to be lots and lots and lots of jobs. And there are not lots and lots of jobs. And what, the people who were in for five years now are still getting, coming through the system. Yeah. When the economy picks up. It was true up, when they said it, though. It was true at that moment yeah. for the people who graduated then. Yeah. And so the problem is in an economy that's changing so fast, this is the main argument we're making here is in, in, in the book, is that, is that the transitions that are occurring are so dramatic. We're seeing almost every part of our economy change. We're going to start seeing autonomous mining in this country. We have autonomous mm -hmm. trucks that are being used in Fort McMurray and in British Columbia. We're mm -hmm. seeing drones that are replacing people who are doing prospecting. You know Northern Ontario. Prospecting is a big part of the economy up there. Yep. You hire lots of people, hire lots of unskilled people to go into the workforce. So my, my sense of the real challenge, and this mm -hmm. is where parents panic, is that we are losing the jobs for people of average ability and below average ability. We had a lot of jobs in our economy. People who worked in factories, they were putting rivets in cars, right? And they did a really honorable job. And they were hardworking and dependable, and they did their, their honest day's work every day. A lot of those jobs have disappeared. Mm. The forestry's lost thousands of jobs, right? Mining's about to lose a whole bunch of jobs for people of low and below average ability. So what are we creating? But computer programmer jobs, right? Be an animator, work in virtual reality. These are fabulous fields, I love them. And there's lots of opportunities there, right? But they aren't the same people. The ones who are, many of the ones who are going off and working in sort of you know, labor type positions, you know, uh, routine type positions, you cannot take somebody who previously would have dropped out in grade 10 and gone work to the GM plant, you can't necessarily take them and convert them into a computer programmer. Those are very different skills requiring very different abilities. And that, I think, is one of our fundamental challenges. Finally, Ken, uh, EY, the global accountancy firm, I guess they used to call it Ernst & Young, one of Britain's biggest graduate recruiters. They announced last year that they're no longer going to be considering university degrees when assessing potential employees. They're going to use an in-house assessment program, numeracy tests, literacy tests, as a way to assess applicants. 
If you're in the university business, if you're in the business of pumping out graduates, how should you take that news? You should be really scared because it's happening all over the place. There's a bunch of American companies. It works better with large companies. What the American companies are doing is they're saying, we got a competition, we got 10, 10 jobs that pay $100,000 a year. Anybody can apply. There's no academic requirements at all. They do psychological testing, aptitude testing. They bring them in. They give them an intensive uh, work, work training sort of program, maybe two months or something like that, and they all start at $100,000. One person has a PhD in chemistry. The other is a grade 10 dropout, and they're working side by side earning the same amount of money. I mean, the part of the reality is that we've lost the capacity to count on the university certificate and credential to mean something specific. For it, a job. For, well, for life. It used to mean really hard worker. Dependable, reliable, you know, no complaining, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it meant that they, they could write and write well. It meant that they could read and read well. They could do research. They could think creatively. And now, I guarantee you, I can show you thousands of Canadian graduates who have all of those credentials. And I can show you a bunch of other ones with exactly the same degree, exactly the same credential, don't write very well, can't do the mathematics very well, aren't very good creative thinkers. So I think, when, quite frankly, this is happening in Asia a lot already, in Japan and, and, and Korea in particular, why would you go back to the university degree as being that guarantor of certain qualities and skills and abilities when you have really simple systems basically they're computer-based psych psychological tests and aptitude tests, you got a really simple system that can find a brilliant student who's 17 years old. I predict that in, the, in 10 years from now, some of the most advanced companies in Canada will be recruiting out of high school. They'll go back into grade 11 and 12 and find the kids they want. They'll bring them into, the, into their employment and they'll train them, even getting a university degree while they work. How will those kids become good citizens? Because those companies aren't going to turn them into good citizens. I think a university does that for them. I think a university can do that for them. I wish I, I, wish I was as confident as you. I wish I had seen as much of that. The brilliant students, I'll say again, mm. are brilliant, right? But does that guarantee them? I don't think so. Mm. You know, it, it's a terrible thing to do and perhaps unfair, but, you know, there's a fair number of university graduates supporting Donald Trump in the United States. And does that, the university education is supposed to give you the ability to think critically and think wisely and think in the national interest? I don't see a match there. So I'm, I'm not as optimistic on that particular side. And I think if you go back to it, you'll discover that a lot of that citizenship is created by families. Ken, next time you come here, we're going to make you emperor of the post-secondary system in Canada, and you will tell us how, when you wave your magic wand, you're going to fix all of this. That's Ken Coates, Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the University of Saskatchewan, and he's the co-author of Dream Factories, Why Universities Won't Solve the Youth Jobs Crisis. Thanks, Ken. More than welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.